Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, our event today. Welcome to everybody, to our brothers and to all of our guests. We are here today uh, to take advantage of what I would call a wonderful opportunity, uh, not only for the Brothers of Alpha, but, but for the whole state of Georgia. We are here to, to talk about our 2022 public policy and legislative update. And we have none other than our representative, Derek Jackson, uh, who will be speaking and I will introduce him shortly. But before I do that, I want to introduce our district director, uh, Brother uh, Sherman Lofton Jr., our 14th uh, district director for the state of Georgia. And thank you, Brother Lofton, for uh, allowing the, the region to host this event and appreciate all that you do. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Brother Lofton. Great. Thank you, Brother Hicks. And good evening, my brothers of Alpha. And as well, I also want to welcome any of our fellow Divine Nine members and, and, and brothers and sisters, family members, neighbors, et cetera, that are joining us for this event tonight. Tonight, you're going to hear from Representative Derek Jackson as he provides a legislative update, as well as a po public policy update, um, as we all are aware uh, that this legislative session has just concluded. Um, a little while ago. And so, you know, this session, like most others, uh, had its controversies. Uh, so Brother Jackson will speak to those and, and help us understand what these changes represent. What are the laws that are being signed by the governor? What is the impact to us as a people and to our communities? And additionally, as a fraternity, what are those issues that will be the hot button issues that we'll need to galvanize ourselves around, especially this year uh, coming into a uh, into the midterm elections? Um, so we're looking forward to hearing from Brother Representative Jackson, uh, getting that bird's eye view and understanding to help us as alpha men to know what we need to do to get our marching orders uh, so that we get into these communities over the summer and throughout the fall. Uh, what we'll be engaging our communities on. Thank you, Brother Hicks. Thank you, Brother Lofton. Appreciate that, and thanks for uh, the welcome. Well, folks, we're here today uh, to talk specifically with Representative uh, Jackson, and for him to give us, as Brother Lofton has said, an update on the legislative uh, session that we just recently came out of. Uh, many of you probably know him, but if you don't, uh, I've known uh, Brother Jackson for a long time. Brother Derek Jackson 
Uh, he's a 22-year uh, military officer, a veteran of the United States Navy. Uh, he's even uh, been a corporate general manager. Uh, he, he's an adjutant, adjutant professor, an entrepreneur, a nonprofit board member, uh, and a leader, uh, just a phenomenal leader in our community and is known for his determination, enthusiasm, and keen work ethics. Uh, he's also, Derek is also known for his integrity and a strong commitment to serve uh, his constituents. If you haven't had a chance to, to hear uh, Brother Representative Jackson speak, uh, once you hear him tonight, you're gonna realize his passion uh, for helping other folks. Derek says that he was born to serve, uh, has no problem rolling up his sleeves and doing all of the hard work and again, I think you're going to know that uh, after this evening, if you don't know it already. Uh, Brother Jackson lives in Fayette County uh, and is married to Representative Camilla Jackson, and they have seven kids together. So they have a they have a they have a household of folks, and uh, but both of them serve our community. So right now, uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Brother Representative Derek Jackson so that he can talk about the legislative update in our past session. Brother Jackson. There we go. Thank you, my good friend, uh, Brother Hicks, uh, for that very warm introduction. And also, uh, thank you to our district director, Brother Sherman Lofton, um, for this opportunity uh, to share what took place this 2021-22 legislative session. I think it's important because sometimes the only information that we get is through the AJC or a news outlet of your choice. Uh, what you don't get is the behind the scenes, some of the, the what happened. Um, during our legislative session, uh, we deal with anywhere between 900 to 1,200 pieces of legislation. Some of them may have two pages. Some of them may have 200 to 300 pages. Uh, but yours truly <clears throat> read each and every piece of legislation, especially the legislation that are very contentious, the ones that harm us the most. <clears throat> you know, I like I love to frame this evening, if I may, uh, that legislation, there are only two purposes, two purposes for legislation. My goalposts are legislation that helps families, and then there's the legislation that hurt families. That's it. The legislation is either going to help you or harm you. And when you think about what we're going to be discussing this evening, think about those two goalposts. Think about, is this legislation going to help my family or will it hurt my family? See, since I've been under the gold dome and, and it's been an honor and a privilege to represent the 64th House District these last six years, what I discovered, uh, the, not all legislation is created equal. Uh, unfortunately, we hear just the headlines of the legislation. And so what I would like to do is look at the buckets of legislation from a cultural, social perspective. And then there's the fiscal side of things, because these are your tax dollars, ladies and gentlemen, your tax dollars. In fact, when I was first elected in 2016, our budget was $19.2 billion, $19.2 billion. This year, we just voted on a $30.1 billion. Just imagine you own a company and in six years, you grew it $11 billion. And so, the issue is not money. Georgia is a very wealthy state, very wealthy state. To grow any in particular, I don't care how you look at it, but to grow anything, $11 billion in six years during a pandemic on the heels of a great recession, think about that bookmark, right? And so not one of our 159 counties, not one of our 537 cities in Georgia had to file bankruptcy. 
But the challenge, the reason why I'm highlighting our, our budget first, because the challenge is our budget, unfortunately, doesn't reflect the values to help all 10.8 million Georgians. That's so unfortunate. We continue to have this conversation around Medicaid expansion. In fact, um, the Democrats, our caucus, our party that I'm, uh, um, that I'm in, um, we bring forth legislation to urge uh, the governor to go ahead and sign into law, expand Medicaid. We're leaving billions and billions of dollars on the table. Why am I talking about health care first when you talk about this budget? Because if there's nothing else that we have not learned in these last two and a half, three years now, while we're still in this pandemic, just look at the news, over 37,000 Georgians have died that to this day, I don't think should have died. But because we didn't have the healthcare system, which is as fragile, which was very evident how fragile our healthcare system is in Georgia. In fact, I looked at a news report today, Georgia's healthcare is ranked number 45. Women's health in Georgia is ranked number 47. So although we love to tout we're the number one state to do business, unfortunately, our budget doesn't reflect to position us to be the number one state for families. And so healthcare is a the second largest chunk of our budget. The first chunk is public education, and I'll get to public education in a second. But healthcare is still an issue for us because we have hospitals that are still closing. That's very unfortunate. Majority of these hospitals, eight of them in particular, what I'm thinking about, are in rural Georgia. Now, when you think about you know, where you live, what county you live, um, you may say, well, you know, yeah, that's unfortunate, maybe because things are changing. What's really happening is that resources are not properly distributed across our state. And so our quality of our health care should not be based on the proximity of Atlanta. These hospitals that are closing in rural Georgia, where some of our families, some of our friends uh, actually reside, should not close. When I think about where we are in this pandemic, think about where we were two and a half years ago when Albany, right here, small 90,000 population, Albany, was the hot spot for COVID just two and a half years ago. And when you think about why Albany, because Albany has a hospital named Phoebe that serves 40 counties. Think about that for a second. A hospital that serves 40 counties. Phoebe Hospital almost has 700 beds. As I said, Albany population is 90,000. Now, can you expand that to 40 counties? It's going to make it challenging. And so we should have done some things that we should have to prevent death. The other reason why, um, before we start talking about policy and why it's so important, that's one of the legislation that we that we brought forward was to span Medicaid. The other one was around public education. We have 1.8 million children in our public education system, but not all school systems are created equal. During this pandemic, we've watched where children had to learn from home but some of those children inefficiently could not because they didn't have a laptop. And even those children that had a laptop didn't have broadband. Think about that for a second. Here we are in 2022, and still we have cities in Georgia with limited to no broadband. And so we have to put everything in perspective. We have to draft legislation that's either going to help families, or remember, as I stated, there's other pieces of legislation that could harm you. And so this year, this just give you a few, I'm not gonna go through all 900 pieces of legislation, 
But I just want to give you a highlight when I say this is around cultural and social challenges that we have here in Georgia. So say, for example, uh, you still have a party that's going after your voting rights. Think about that. So Senate Bill 202, I'm not going to get through all those 98 pages, but you all recall last year that when Senate Bill 202 was um, signed into law uh, by the current governor. And you're probably saying, well, why, 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 why are we here? Why are we still fighting the same fight that some of our grandparents and others fought 50, 60 years ago? See, Senate Bill 202, although they use the word integrity and ethics and eth being ethical and um, safeguarding and security, uh, all of those were just simple buzzwords. They did quite the opposite. Um, in fact, they were so opposite when they used the word integrity. They said, we want to make sure that every Georgian get a chance to vote. And that makes sense to me. We all want every citizen that are eligible to vote to do exactly that. Even one of our late, great, beloved, iconic alphas of all time, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, talked about and fought for voting rights, right? He was right there on the front line, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, right? And there's a host of others. But think about this. We're fighting the same fight. Here we are. Why is it that we had to use drop boxes? Great question. Because we were in the middle of a pandemic. Drop box has been around since the last 12 years. Um, in fact, Republicans came up with drop boxes. And this is not about Republicans or Democrats. This is about right and wrong. And so the drop boxes we had to use to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to still exercise their right, their civic duty by voting. And that was done efficiently and effectively. It kept everyone safe. In fact, if you were, you know, let's say for those who work shifts like doctors and nurses and those who work at e-commerce and warehousing, you know, uh, once you got off work, let's say it's seven o'clock, eight o'clock at night, you were able to complete your absentee ballot and drop it in a, a very secure box. Until this date, no one has informed us that any of these drop boxes were vandalized or hauled off or tampered with or anything of that nature. And so the process worked. Citizens in Georgia were able to cast their ballot and rightfully so. But here's the thing, Senate Bill 202, uh, and, and I know Fulton County because I'm the vice chair of the delegation of Fulton County. So I'll use Fulton County as, as an example. So Fulton County, they had 38 drop boxes, 38 spread across 80 miles, right? That's how big Fulton County is. And so citizens used all 38 of these drop boxes. But now Senate Bill 202 has reduced the number and use of drop boxes down to six. So there's no integrity to reduce the access of drop boxes. There's no integrity in that. There's no security in that. There's restriction and limitations, right? And so this year, because Senate Bill 202 did not go far enough, they brought in another uh, bill, Senate Bill 89, which allows for the uh, GBI, Georgia Bureau of Investigation, to now have jurisdiction. Now that can um, create a problem within itself, right? Uh, that, that could be used in a, as a, an intimidation tool. Um, it, it, there's just a plethora of reasons why you don't want the GBI to have that kind of jurisdiction, right? Uh, the Secretary of State should be able to investigate uh, if a complaint is filed by a citizen or something that, you know, feel um, that something's wrong uh, at the uh, voting precinct. And so there's a process that's been working for quite some time, but now just this year, Senate Bill 89 
which we're sure it's going to be signed into law. The another bill um, that um, was not successful because we had to stop it was Senate Bill 171, the anti-protest bill. Citizens, ladies and gentlemen, you should always have the right to approach your government. You should always have the right to peacefully protest, to let your voice be heard. Protesting has been around for some, a very long time, right? It's an opportunity for citizens and organization to um, basically uh, get the attention of their government. No different than the Montgomery boy, bus boycott, right? To effectively get the attention of your government. Well, Senate Bill 171, although it did not pass, I mean, I want to be absolutely clear, but this anti protest bill would have made a, a, a very um, harmful situation in our society if it would have got through the legislative process, but the clock ran out. And so um, we got to keep our eyes attuned to uh, legislation such as this, because the First Amendment right, which we all have, allows for you to be able to speak freely and to peacefully protest. Um, there was another a bill that was defeated, <clears throat> Senate Bill 456. Again, this now this Senate Bill 456 dealt with abortion. Um, there are 18 pieces of legislation in Georgia that dictates a woman's body. If I ask you the question, how many pieces of legislation that dictates a man's body, the answer would be zero. Listen, uh, as uh, Brother Hicks mentioned, I have four daughters and I have three sons. Um, I want my four daughters to have the same rights as my three sons. And if uh, it need be uh, to understand, um, you know, when it comes down to pro-choice or pro-life, uh, it should not be a man that makes that decision. It should be a woman. But it should not be a man that's writing that legislation, right? It should be a woman that's writing that legislation. It should, it should be a woman that advocates for her anatomy. And we have to allow for women to make decision for women. And um, another bill that we defeated was Senate Bill 226. Uh, we call it the book banning bill. They wanted to remove books off the shelves in schools and libraries. Uh, listen. America has history and not all that history is very good history, but we shouldn't be in the business of removing books. I mean, you can look behind my left and right shoulder, uh, my personal library here at home. I have tons of books that talk about America's history, the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But if we start getting into the business as government starting to ban books or what type of books are taught or, or read in school, then I just think that we're gonna miss out and create unintended consequences, right? Uh, we all should learn culturally and socially um, about history and learn from it and have conversations around it, but no piece of legislation like Senate Bill 226 should be in the business that allowed for government to ban books or to be subjective on what uh, curriculum or what information is taught uh, in our schools or sold in our stores. Another bill that, um, that was highly contentious that I'm sure you all heard about uh, is critical race theory. House Bill 1084. First off, let me be absolutely clear. Critical race theory is not taught in our K through 12 grades. In fact, it's taught at the collegiate level as an elective in law school. Critical race theory has its proper place. In fact, critical race theory, the term 
was someone's doctoral thesis like 35, 36 years ago. So it's been around for quite some time, but um, unfortunately during this midterm election cycle, a critical race theory has been designed to be the boogeyman, I call it. Um, we're not teaching first graders or fifth graders or 12th graders anything about critical race theory. Are we talking about black history? Absolutely. Much like we should be talking about white history, right? Are we talking about good, bad, and in between? Yes, right? So we should talk about slavery just like we talk about um, the Civil War, the American Revolution, or any other historical point, right? Will it make a child feel uncomfortable? Possibly. Possibly. Don't know. We all had, I had to learn about George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. Um, but it was great to be able to learn about W.E. Du Bois and Booker T and Dr. King for that information to be available, right? That's what helps us to become a civil society. And so House Bill 1084 was designed to abolish African-American history. It was designed that the bill didn't pass. I just want to be clear. House Bill 1084 did not pass. But if you read the tenets of this piece of legislation, it was to remove African-American history, right? To say that Malcolm X should not be taught. Rosa Parks should not be taught. And that's wrong on his face. Senate Bill 393 was another piece of legislation that did not pass. Senate Bill 393 wanted to regulate you on social media. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your right to be on whatever social media platform that you may select. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok, I don't know. But whichever platform you so choose, you should be able to post, say, and do whatever you feel. You don't need Senate Bill 393 to regulate to say that you can't delete a post. You can't only say certain things in a post that goes against the First Amendment right. That's the reason why you have to be very, very careful about state laws. And you have to be vigilant about state laws. Again, if the legislation is gonna help me or hurt me, right? That's it, that's the goalpost. Now I wanna transition, you know, talk, I talked, those are the bills that we defeated. And there was a, uh, there's so many more, um, but those are some highlights on how contentious this past legislative session was. Here's um, some bills, unfortunately, uh, that will be going to the governor for signature. And some of these may have already been signed by the time you watch um, this, um, this uh, review here, uh, may have already been signed into law with Governor Kemp. For example, Senate Bill 319, I know this is already signed into law. He just did it the other day. Constitutional carry. Uh, listen, brothers and, and sisters and others who, who are joining us this evening. When you look at Senate Bill 319, constitutional carry, to allow for a citizen to purchase a gun without a license to abolish small arms license. And that's unfortunate. You can't even go fishing in Georgia without a fishing license. You cannot go hunting in Georgia without a hunting license. You cannot drive an automobile without a license. This is not to make life difficult on a citizen. But when you think about where we have been since Easter, 
the number of shootings right here in Atlanta, Georgia. The homicide right here in the state of Georgia. So how is it that on one side of the argument, we're protecting our Second Amendment right, the right to bear arms. I'm for all that, right? I'm a retired naval officer. I get that. The Second Amendment right. But then you pass a piece of legislation, Senate Bill 319, to say you don't need to carry, you don't need to get a, a small arms carry license anymore. So how is that going to help us to add more guns into our society? Now, listen, I know you're all saying, well, listen, the bad guy don't get a license. Absolutely, I get it. But you just changed the equation for a police officer. Listen, full transparency, I have family members that are in law enforcement. I have nieces and nephews who are police officers, state troopers, okay? And so police organizations did not want Senate Bill 319. Nobody was asking for constitutional carry. No Georgians did a protest and say, we need more guns on the street to keep us safe. That was the argument, they said. More guns on the street will keep us safe. This is about the Second Amendment right. There's no truth in that. Adding more guns to our streets right here in Georgia is not going to make anybody safer. No more safer than saying that we need the armed teachers to carry guns in the classroom. It doesn't make any sense. But unfortunately, that bill was signed into law against all the arguments that yours truly and others in the Democratic Party said, please do not sign this law. Citizens are asking us. Police officers, as quiet as was kept, did not want this bill. But unfortunately, it was signed into law. Another bill um, that's going before the governor is Senate Bill 435. Um, they call this the uh, attack against transgender athletes. Uh, listen, um, there is some legislation, I would say, that was designed just for a political party to get their base excited. This is one of them. We never had a problem from the beginning of time for men and women to decide which bathroom they're going to go use. We just never had a problem. Even those who are making the transition from one gender to the other, we never had a problem. And the other reason why we never had a problem because you don't know who's using what bathroom and why. And there's no way of enforcing this. No one's going to be standing on the, at the door to check and see if you're a male or female. Because that goes against your right, your civil liberties. So this is a piece of legislation that, that, that there's no value. Does it help your family or does it harm your family? Right? Um, another uh, contentious bill was Senate Bill 345, the vaccine mandates. Listen, I, let me be fully transparent uh, with you all. During my 22 years in the Navy, the Navy gave me more shots than I could count because I had to go into countries for deployment or special operations to keep my immune system and myself and my sailors and my officers safe. We need vaccines, vaccines work. There's a reason why you don't hear us talking about polio 
It doesn't mean polio disappeared. It still exists, but we are all vaccinated. Your children had to get vaccinated in order to go to a public school. You don't hear us talking about smallpox. Doesn't mean it's smallpox is gone. We're vaccinated. Mumps, measles, you follow my drift. So we've had vaccines to help our immune system to fight off all these ugly bugs that may pop their rear, rearest ugly head in our society. It's no different than if you catch a common cold or flu. You take something to help your body in that situation. Right. If you get a fever of 100 degrees, you, you have to take something to regulate that. And so Senate Bill 345, the vaccine mandates, says that you shouldn't be forced. <laughs> we raise our right hand to keep you safe. That's what this is about, It's to keep you safe. But when you have legislation like Senate Bill 345 that challenges medical doctors, some of you are our doctors and nurses, and you know the aims of your healthcare profession, you all raise your right hand as well to do no harm. For these past two and a half, three years, we've asked our doctors and nurses and other first responders to do things that we never imagined. Because family members could not be in those ICU rooms as their loved ones were slipping away from this world. So doctors and nurses were there to hold their hands as they took their final breath because they did not get the vaccine because of misinformation and disinformation in our society. That's why it's so imperative to read legislation, to know what your elected officials are doing and hold them accountable. We have to stop playing games. Over 37,000 Georgians have died because of misinformation and disinformation. In my 56 years of living, I've never seen when our society started attacking medical doctors and nurses, challenging them about this vaccine. The vaccine wasn't killing us, it was the virus, COVID-19 that's still mutating, that's still around. But my friends on the other side of the aisle felt the urge to pass Senate Bill 345 and it heads to the governor's desk now. I don't think he'll veto it. I think he's gonna sign it into law. He wanted this bill. The other one is House Bill 1178, Parent Bill of Rights. Now that sounds good, but parents always had the right to determine what their children should learn in school. Let's take sex education, for example. Most of us can recall that before our teachers taught us sex education, that our parents had to sign a permission slip. It was required. And so we got to think about um, what we need to do to make sure that uh, legislation such as this, um, to make sure that uh, legislation help families and not hurt families. And then last but not least, <clears throat> um, some good bills came out. One good bill is House Bill 1013 around mental health. 
we do pass some good legislation to help families. We have a mental health crisis here in Georgia. And although this bill is the first step in the right direction, but we still need to take a comprehensive approach around mental health. This last two and a half, three years, this pandemic alone placed a lot of our children and families, men and women, husband and wives uh, in a different kind of mental state. We never had to deal with sheltering in place, um, wearing a mask. Um, it just changed our society. And so mental health, we saw a spike right here in Georgia. And we needed this piece of legislation. So House Bill 1013, I think, is a good piece of legislation. And then House Bill 304, the gas tax holiday was our way. Um, and as the federal government do their thing, we as a state stepped in and said the gas at the pump was too high. And so we passed House Bill 304 to help mitigate some of the high costs um, that we all were experiencing um, at the gas pump. And so that's just a, 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 a thumbnail sketch of what took place these last three months during our legislative session. And uh, with that, uh, Brother Daryl Hicks, um, I think I done put everybody to sleep, but I just wanted to give a nice overview of the good, bad, ugly of this legislative session. Thank you, Brother Jackson. I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I, I really do, and I'm, I'm sure the Brotherhood appreciates uh, what you do down at the Capitol, uh, as well as your wife, Camille, does down at the Capitol for the citizens of Georgia, not just the citizens of your district. You did a very good job of outlining some of those key bills uh, that passed, uh, that didn't pass, uh, and talking about your passion around uh, what you do down at the Capitol. Let's shift gears, gears just a little bit here. You are running for Lieutenant Governor of the state of Georgia. And I'd like to give you a little opportunity to talk about that. And, and before, before, I, before I do that, let me just make a note to our audience. If you have any questions, just put your questions in the, uh, in the message uh, or chat box and we will ask your questions. But Derek, you're, you're running for Lieutenant Governor, uh, a very critical role to have in the state of Georgia. Uh, if you don't mind, take about three minutes and talk about why you're running, and then we'll get to some questions that you can elaborate a little bit more on your strategy. Yes. Now, listen, Brother Hicks, uh, I appreciate any opportunity um, to talk about why I'm the candidate of choice for lieutenant governor. First experience. Um, I've been fighting for uh, our democracy, voting rights, civil rights, women's rights. LGBTQ rights before it was LGBTQ since 1983. I'm the only candidate uh, with 38 years uh, with this level of experience that you need someone uh, in the lieutenant governor position. Because the thing, uh, the three things that you got to think about lieutenant governor is the lieutenant governor needs to be available and ready if need be for whatever reason, if the, if the governor becomes incapacitated or removed from office to fit, to become the governor. That's number one. Number two, the Lieutenant governor presides over the state Senate. You have to have legislative experience to be able to skillfully make sure that some of the legislation that we talked about know how to defeat in the state Senate because this, the Lieutenant governor presides over the state Senate. And then number three, the Lieutenant governor needs to be very skillful and capable uh, to assist the governor in the administrative and operations of the state, especially when um, you look at all 365 days, because the legislative general assembly is only in session for the first three months of the year. So I'm running to become the next lieutenant governor because my experience. Two, number two is my compassion. We got to get away from uh, simply just doing things uh, status quo. A lot of families are hurting out there. And, and, and I'm focusing on my candidacy for Lieutenant Governor around family. 
listen, I came from a single parent home. My mother was a nurse. She raised me and my three sisters. Um, and she always reminded me, you got to do the le do the most for the least of these. And you got to use, uh, have compassion and a heart filled with grace. And then number three is this capability. Uh, as you stated in the opening remarks, Brother Hicks, um, I'm results. I deliver on results. Uh, my resume speaks to results. Uh, I'm a, I have a proven track record. And, and that's because of the capability that God gave me to be able to get things done. Um, and, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm asking to earn everybody's uh, vote to become the next lieutenant governor this year. Thank you, Brother Jackson. You did a good job explaining the role. But, you know, there, there, are, there are 10 people, I believe, in the, in the primary in your race. Uh, how do you plan to distinguish yourself between them and, as it relates to carrying out the function of lieutenant governor if you're elected? Yes. No, that's a, listen, the, when you when you examine all of us that are running for lieutenant governor. Um, so you have nine Democrats, one libertarian and four Republican. But for the primary, you're right, it's, it's nine of us. Immediately, you should know that since the office of lieutenant governor, when it was created in 1945, all 12 came from either the House or the Senate. Now, you may ask why, because your lieutenant governor needs to have legislative experience. So out of the nine, there are only three of us serve under the gold dome. Three. Two of us serve with um, then uh, minority leader Stacey Abrams. And so you gotta look at our body of work and that's what differentiates us, right? Experience is one. Number two, you, 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 you gotta be mindful uh, when you go to the ballot box and you look at nine candidates, understand that not all of us are created equal. So you gotta look at experience, what we have done, what kind of legislation and what we're saying got to listen to what we're saying, right? Everybody's talking these buzzwords. And you know this, Brother Hicks, buzzwords and bumper stickers and cliches. Since I've announced 12 months ago, I've been talking about the same thing, family. We love to tell we're the number one state to do business, but we're not the number one state for family. We're not the number one when it comes down to women's health, children's health, public education taking care of our teachers, which I think is still a noble profession. We leave in too many cities and counties behind. Everything cannot revolve around Atlanta. You gotta think about Columbus, mm -hmm. Valdosta, Albany, Savannah, Brunswick, Statesboro, Waynesboro, Swainsboro, all these other counties that are counting on their Lieutenant Governor to be their voice under that gold dome. Mm -hmm. That's what separates me from the others because these last 19 days, I traveled 4,400 miles, Brother Hicks. In 19 days, 4,400 miles because I wanna meet Georgian families where they are, not where I am. Right. Another question uh, for you, and, and you talked a little bit about this, uh, rural Georgia. You talked about broadband and those kind of things. As as the next lieutenant governor, how do you plan on helping rural Georgia deal with a lot of the issues? You talked a little bit about the hospital and the lack of medical care in those communities. But how do you plan to do that as a lieutenant governor, help uh, all Georgians, in particular rural Georgia? As lieutenant governor, you have to know that Georgia represents more than just the 15 counties that call Atlanta metropolitan area. And when I travel to 108 counties, rural Georgia, they're just asking for the most simple things that a lot of us take for granted. Paved roads. Can you believe that we have cities and counties 
that are still asking for paved roads. This, we have cities and counties in Georgia who want broadband, not because they want to be able to get on the internet. Their first responders can't even respond accordingly. They can't do telemedicine in rural Georgia without broadband. I go back to 2017, Brother Hicks, where we gave out of the state house, we had a special session, over $200 million to help South Georgia when they were devastated by that those, those uh, just a number of tornadoes that came through in 2017, devastated some of our small black farmers, right? And so it was hard for them to get back on their feet because they didn't have broadband. It was hard for our first responders to give them aid to help citizens in South Georgia because they didn't have broadband. It was hard for our children to be able to, to have connectivity with their school to learn because they didn't have broadband. And it was even worse when those tried to respond didn't have paved roads the lack of drainage to be able to get their vehicles through. And so we got to make sure that we have a Lieutenant governor that's going to address the needs to all 10.8 million Georgians to make sure that not one County is left behind and everyone should have access to quality health care, not, not based on their zip code. That's what a Lieutenant governor, will be in a position to do to make sure that the budget reflect our values to make sure we are being proactive and not reactive and that comes with experience okay and and so as you talk about uh, the need to provide those services to all of georgia or 10 point uh, oh, 8 point 10 8 point 10 point 8 million citizens uh, and you talk about the disparities, the disparities between metro and rural. Uh, the state is you're, you're running as a Democrat. The state is is highly Republican. If if nothing changes, obviously, you know there's a desire for the, that to change. But if nothing changes, you now have to build relationships in a very, in a very different way, partisan way. Uh, how do you plan on making sure that you can do that as lieutenant governor, and you may very well be dealing with a uh, 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 state uh, constitutional officers that are that don't have as many Democrats where you can make those changes, and particularly in the House and the Senate. If those numbers don't change, you're trying to pass a law uh, with both of those chambers being uh, majority Republican. How do you plan on dealing with that in a bipartisan way, Brother Representative Jackson? You're exactly right, especially after the, the gerrymandering of all these 180 House districts and 56 state Senate districts, did we just watched this year the gerrymandering that took place. But I'm a consensus builder. I, even during my six years under the Gold Dome, even being part of the minority party, the Democratic Party, I was still able to get legislation passed to be able to find a common ground with those on, on the other side of the aisle. The Navy taught me uh, and corporate America has taught me that in the end, if you find what can be the value proposition for both parties, for both sides, to be able to find a middle that's going to be a win-win for everyone. And that's what I have accomplished and delivered these past six years, even in the current my majority minority situation, we're the minority party. There's only 77 Democrats. There's 103 Republicans. You only need 91 votes to vote on anything. So they always had the votes, but we had to be able to go over there and be skillful to reach across the aisle, to get things done because it's not about me. It's about delivering for my constituency of the 64th district. And I was able to do that um, because of my military experience, my corporate America experience, 
and being a consensus builder to be able to get things done for the citizens of Georgia. Wonderful. Um, you know, it, 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 look, I, it's a hard race. You know, I, I say all the time, it's a long road to hold to run statewide. Uh, it's a lot of time, a lot of energy uh, in getting that done. Uh, as you've gone around the state of Georgia, what is it that, in your opinion, people are saying the most? We talked a little bit about generally what the needs are for uh, the citizens. But what are you hearing that people are saying, uh, Derek, if you win this race, you absolutely have to deal with this. And, and given that, uh, how are you going to make that a priority? The number one thing I heard the most from citizens, both in urban, suburban and rural Georgia, they're exhausted of the finger pointing. They're exhausted of the back and forth because, in, in fact, um, there was a white Republican that came up to me. He said, listen, I'm a vote for you. He said, now I can't vote for you during the primary because the way our primary is structured. He said, but uh, I see you in the general election in November and I will vote for you. And I said, well, I'm just curious, sir. Why would you vote for me? Is it because of my military background? He said, oh, no, I, lo I love the fact that you're military. He said, but you speak with a unified voice. He said, I love the fact when you told the story when you were on an aircraft carrier and how you didn't care if that sailor was from Wisconsin or California. If we got struck with a torpedo, that means all hands on deck to make sure that that aircraft carrier doesn't sink. We don't have time to ask, what's your party, where you're from, white or black when a ship is sinking and i see georgia right now when over thirty-seven thousand deaths i truly believe could have been prevented if governor kemp would have took my advice in the early stages of this pandemic but we all know the reason why he didn't we we also know the reason why it took him five and a half six weeks to act upon what i suggested to him because he looked and said, I don't want Derek to get the credit, which I wasn't looking for any credit. I was just trying to simply use my experience and say, we do this abroad. We do this overseas. How to help other countries to give them aid when we do humanitarian operations. And so the one thing I continue to hear as I crisscross Georgia is they're tired of the politics of usual. They want their government to show up. They want their government to deliver on mandated services. They want their government to work for the working families. And that would be my charge on day one to make sure that we're doing those things to help family. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You know, you got, you got brothers on this call and you have others on this call. Talk a little bit about, you know, what is it that 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 your brothers can do to help you in this process? Uh, it's a statewide race. So talk to us. Yeah, listen, I, <laughs> I'm going to be straightforward. Um, one of those individuals of the nine that's running for lieutenant governor was put in by the establishment, the old regime, if you will. And you're going to see who's endorsing this individual, and they dumped $600,000 into their coffers, $600,000. So you can clearly see who the old regime want to become the next lieutenant governor. I reject that. I reject the fact that uh, any old regime should select our lieutenant governor. Clearly, this person do not have the level of experience that I do. You asked the question, what differentiates us? I'm the only candidate that's running for lieutenant governor that's a member of the Divine Nine. Think about that for a second. The, the organizations that we are affiliated with also should determine our character, who we are. So how is it that out of, well, not everybody graduated from college and you don't need a college degree to run for lieutenant governor, 
Um, but why is it that those, and you don't have to be a member of the divine nine, but something has to ask the question, right? I'm the only candidate that that's a that's a life member of the N, of the NAACP. I'm also a life member of, of our beloved fraternity, right? And so when people say they are affiliated with different organizations, you have to take note. And so um, I don't have the old regime dumping six hundred thousand dollars into my campaign. I am asking and I'm humbly requesting that you all help me because it takes money to run for office of this magnitude. Listen, it could be a hundred dollars, it could be a thousand dollars, but I need your support. Not just your support, but if you look at your cell phone, we got hundreds and hundreds of individuals in our cell phones. I need you to share DerekJackson.org and ask them too to make a donation. Because we've all seen this movie before. They did it to, get it, Barack Obama. Can he raise the money? Is he a legit candidate? Not because of his character, not because of his experiences. It was solely, can he raise money? And so I need you all to help me make sure that a narrative is not already being written by the establishment. I need you all like never before. Listen, let me be absolutely clear. The power is in our hands. When you think about why we have a Katanji Brown Jackson, no, no relations, of, of course, but it's good to be a Jackson. But the reason why we have a Katanji Brown Jackson, because we all, we right here in Georgia, stood up. First, we voted. Then we gave a, a financial contribution to those who were running in 2020. And then we had the audacity to come back in 2021 and elected not one, but two United States senators. Senators Warnock and Ossoff. And now I'm asking right here in 2022 to show that regardless of whatever anti-voting bills that they bring to Governor Kemp's desk to sign into law, that they cannot stop us. That we can uh, have a governor and lieutenant governor of our choosing, not because somebody dumped $600,000 into the coffers of the other candidate. And you all will see who, who I'm talking about here soon. Don't want to mention no names. But look at the endorsements. Look how much money they've raised, supposedly, right? We don't know where they got their money from, but nonetheless, they have it. And so I am asking, not just the divine nine, I'm asking everyone that watch us this evening to chip in today. Our next campaign finance deadline is April 30th. That's three days from now. But I'm asking you all to do it today, right now. If this, is, this, is, this is as plain as I can be. I need your help. See, I can win with you, but I cannot win without you. I, 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 I can't. I need you, right? I need your financial contribution today, and then I need your vote on May 2nd. So let's, that's the first day of early voting. Don't wait till May 24th. All right, Brother Jackson, thank you so much. Uh, you've done a great job of explaining uh, who you are, what you're about, and what you're trying to accomplish sincerely appreciate the legislative update brothers you you all have heard uh brother jackson and, and you know he needs your help uh and so for all of the folks that are online including the brothers uh please consider and go on to their jackson's website uh and contribute and brother jackson do you want to state that website for you it's on the screen but 
you can go ahead and verbalize it as well. Yes, again, it's DerekJackson.org. That's I know there's eight different ways you can spell Derek, but there's only one in the dictionary, as my mama told me. That's D-E-R-R-I-C-K, DerekJackson.org. And this, you'll see the donate button right there on the top. Um, please, ma'am, please, sir, make your financial contribution today. Let's keep this campaign alive and going. Once we win, we will be the change that we all desire. I can win with you, but I cannot win without you. Folks, please go out and help this brother. I, I promise you, I've known him a long time and uh, he will be a great Lieutenant Governor for the state of Georgia. So I strongly encourage you to go out and support him. Uh, before I uh, give the final closing statements, there you said a lot and you've you been closed. Is there anything that you missed that you wanna get out there? Here's a chance, you go ahead and get it out there and then I'll, I'll close this out there. Now, I just wanna say thank you, Brother Hicks, um, for moderating this evening and again, uh, thank you to our district director, uh, Brother uh, Sherman Lofton, and to all of those who uh, took time out of your busy schedule tonight. Uh, I appreciate you um, doing such because it's not often that you get a chance to hear about the candidates and learn a little bit more about the candidates and why you should vote and financially support the candidates. And so prayerfully, um, I've done that tonight to let you know why I'm the best candidate for Lieutenant Governor, and you can hold me accountable. Um, that's the reason why I, I always give up my cell phone number and my email address, because the conversation doesn't end tonight. We continue on the conversation well past our victory come May 24th. Thank you, Brother Jackson. Um, I want to also thank uh, our, our district director, Brother Lofton. Uh, Brother Lofton had to uh, join another call, but I want to thank him for uh, allowing us to do this and giving us the opportunity. Also want to thank uh, Brother Dr. Will Simmons, who is the chair of the Alpha Africa Capital Committee. Uh, Brother, Brother Simmons is also uh, doing his, he, he's working uh, right now this evening, so he couldn't, he couldn't uh, divert from that. And then to our IT person, uh, Brother uh, Reddick, uh, for his help. And then everybody else who has helped make this happen. And to all of the folks who joined this call, thank you so much for taking the time to first get informed about what's happening down at our Capitol. And Brother Jackson has done a great job of explaining that. And then secondly, uh, unless we go out and vote and make decisions at the polls, then we have this kind of issues that Brother Jackson's talked about uh, in the legislative session. We need him down there to help neutralize that and also be a, 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 a force for the citizens of Georgia. So thank you everyone for attending this event. We appreciate it and God bless each of you.